Chapter Seventeen of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Seven, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Sixteen: Prisoners of War. The treatment on both sides of prisoners of war is a subject which any one of ordinary sensibility would gladly avoid, but it is too important to pass over in silence. We shall deal with it briefly. We cannot persuade ourselves to repeat in these pages the stories of horrible suffering which may be found in the narratives of the survivors of the prison pens, but it would not be just to omit all mention of one of the most dreadful results of the war. By even a slight reference to the unspeakable woes inflicted upon tens of thousands of human beings by a state of civil war, we may hope to bring home to the minds of readers of a later generation some sense of what a conflict means. It is not to arraign the people of the South that this chapter is written. We know them to be in general of the same blood, the same feelings, as those of the North. If during several years they subjected their kindred, whom the fortunes of battle threw into their hands, to horrors which it is no figure of speech to call infernal, it is not they who are to blame, but the circumstances which rebellion brought upon the people of the whole country. The entire subject of the exchange and treatment of prisoners is fully set forth in a volume of 1,200 pages issued by the 40th Congress in 1869. It embodies the results of a year's labor of a committee of Congress in the course of which the members were so shocked and inflamed by the contemplation of the frightful stories of suffering which were told them that their own language takes on the tone of the half-frantic victims of Andersonville. The reader who desires to look thoroughly into this revolting subject is referred to this book and to the sworn testimony of the witnesses in the trial of Wirtz, the keeper of the Andersonville prison. The first volume of the Southern Historical Society papers is mainly devoted to the Confederate view of the case. We merely refer to these documents as giving the two sides of the question from strongly partisan points of view. The most candid and accurate statement of the treatment of the question of exchanges is to be found in General E. R. S. Canby's report to the 40th Congress, which gives all the correspondence between the two governments. As to the treatment of Union prisoners, after long deliberation, we have resolved not to quote from any northern source. In the pages of the works above mentioned, and in the personal narratives of Union officers and soldiers, such as Davidson, Goss, Isham, and hundreds of others, the reader may find the hideous story told in detail. We restrict ourselves here, as to the question of exchange, to the official correspondence of the two governments, and as to the treatment of prisoners, to the reports and sworn statements of Confederate officers. One of the earliest embarrassments of the government was the question how insurgents captured with arms in their hands should be treated. No one rightly estimated the extent or the duration which the insurrection was to assume. If it were to be speedily brought to a close, a cartel for the exchange of prisoners was altogether undesirable. If it were to continue any length of time, such an exchange would of course become necessary, but it must be effected with care and circumspection, lest in the process the insurrectionary government should extort some quasi-recognition of its legality. The matter ought not, perhaps, to have presented any insurmountable difficulty. The law of nations clearly enough provides for all such incidents of civil war. A nation loses none of its rights by following the dictates of humanity. As Dr. Theodore D. Woosley says, the same rules of war are required in such a war as in any other. The same ways of fighting, the same treatment of prisoners, of combatants or of non-combatants, and of private property by the army where it passes. In general, the relations of the parties ought to be nearly those of ordinary war, which humanity demands, and will be, because otherwise the law of retaliation will be applied. But in these early days of the war, the state was so encompassed by dangers at home and abroad that the simplest actions seemed of doubtful propriety. The government had not only to guard against a vigilant opposition at home, ready to seize upon any pretext for attack, but it had also to be constantly in an attitude of defense against European powers, which would have taken advantage of anything in the conduct of the United States government that would justify the recognition of the Confederacy. 
recognition once granted, intervention would not have been far distant. When the United States troops in Texas were surrendered by Twiggs, they were granted terms of ostentatious liberality. They are our friends, the Texan commissioners wrote. They have heretofore afforded our people all the protection in their power, and we owe to them every consideration. They were to be allowed to leave the state unmolested, carrying their arms with them. But before they got away, the collision at Fort Sumter took place, and they were seized and disarmed, some paroled and some imprisoned. A part of them were released, but others were held in defiance of the terms of Twig's surrender for over two years. After the war began, no treatment seemed harsh enough for these friends and protectors of the frontiers. Various citizens wrote to Jefferson Davis suggesting that they be put to hard labor on the railroads, that they be starved unless the United States would feed them, that they be put on a diet of bread and water, that their legs should be broken and they be turned loose, that those among them who were foreigners should be killed. These suggestions were referred by Mr. Davis to his Secretary of War. During the year 1861, no general policy for the exchange of prisoners was adopted. In the temper both parties were in, no formal cartel was possible. The Confederates demanded the treatment of a recognized government, which the United States was not prepared to grant. Yet exchanges were made from time to time by generals in the field, at the bidding of immediate necessity, and without touching the larger questions. At the opening of the year 1862, the Washington authorities, desiring to release the prisoners of the First Battle of Bull Run, made an effort to effect an exchange. But the Confederate demands seemed inadmissible. These were, in fact, that seamen taken in rebel privateers should be exchanged on equal terms with seamen in the merchant service, that United States regulars should not be exchanged for Southern volunteers, and that no proposition for the exchange of Southern privateers should be considered without an absolute unconditional abandonment of the pretext that they are pirates, their release from confinement as felons, and their treatment as other prisoners of war. The President had already resolved to adopt the course here suggested in regard to rebel privateers. The certainty of bloody reprisals upon Union officers in Richmond had induced the President to give up all thought of exceptional treatment of privateers, even before the end of 1861. Four men of the crew of the privateer Jefferson Davis had been convicted of piracy and sentenced to death. Others were awaiting trial. The law seemed sufficiently clear. But even if Mr. Lincoln had been able to withhold a pardon from brave men engaged in what they considered their duty, he could never have thus sentenced to death an equal number of Union officers in rigorous confinement marked out for shameful execution. But before any formal action was taken in relation to exchange, the President made an effort to alleviate the condition of our prisoners in the South by appointing the Reverend Bishop Ames and the Honorable Hamilton Fish commissioners to visit them and minister to their wants. A large sum of money was given them for this purpose, and they were also instructed to make a list of all prisoners, giving such particulars as might be interesting and proper for their families to know, or useful to this government for the purpose of effecting their exchange or release. They were authorized to assure the Richmond authorities that prisoners held by the United States might receive like visitation and relief. All this was notified to the Confederate government by General Wool, commanding at Fort Monroe. In reply, they ignored the purpose of the commission entirely and appointed James A. Seddon and C. M. Conrad to meet them at Fort Monroe and negotiate an exchange of prisoners. Mr. Fish and Bishop Ames, being thus repulsed in their humane and charitable mission, went back to Washington, returned the money with which they had been entrusted, and resigned their office. The President, willing to sacrifice not only his own sense of dignity but something of national right to relieve a large amount of suffering, yielded every point of the Confederate demands and ordered arrangements to be made for a general exchange. General Wool and General Howell Cobb, therefore, met on the 23rd of February to settle the details of the business. But the consummation so ardently desired by the friends of the prisoners was again postponed through the persistence with which the Confederate agent clung to certain phrases by which he hoped to gain some recognition from the United States of the territorial integrity of the Confederacy. He insisted that the cartel should contain a provision for delivering prisoners of either side at the frontier of their own country, respectively. As the Confederates claimed, at one time or another, all the slave states, this phrase might have been taken to mean the Ohio River or the southern boundary of Iowa. It was objected to by the President, and General Wool was ordered to make no arrangement except for actual exchanges. 
A few exchanges were made, but the question of hostages held against the privateersmen remained for a long time unsettled. The United States placed the men captured at sea and convicted as pirates on the list of prisoners, and tendered them for exchange by a letter from General Wool on the 13th of February. On the 18th, Mr. Benjamin, Confederate Secretary of War, accepted this assurance as entirely satisfactory, said the hostages had been placed on the footing of other prisoners and would be at once sent home on parole. But on the failure of Generals Wool and Cobb to agree on a general cartel, these officers were, in defiance of this agreement, which had nothing to do with the cartel, once more remanded to their distressing position as hostages, and every attempt made by the United States for their release only riveted their fetters more strongly. The Confederates never positively refused to give them up, but repeated promises to exchange them were broken. The privateersmen were sent to Fort Monroe, placed on a flag of truce boat, conveyed to City Point, and kept there five days under promise of exchange for the hostages. But the Confederate authorities could not bring themselves to part with such valuable property. The privateersmen were brought back, and the hostages continued to languish in prison for several months longer. At last, on the 22nd of July, 1862, after infinite correspondence, our cartel was agreed upon between General Dix and General D. H. Hill, under which the exchange of prisoners was begun. But the course of the exchange never ran smooth. There was seldom a pretext lacking to interrupt its practical working. Robert Old, who was placed in charge of the prisoners soon after the cartel was agreed upon, was a man of unsuitable temper and character for such a delicate and responsible duty. He was not content with carrying out, with extravagant zeal, the orders of his superiors, but was continually seeking cause of dispute with the federal agents of exchange. With such a disposition existing both in Richmond and at the office of exchange, it is not surprising that frequent wranglings arose. It would be tedious to recount these controversies in detail. A few may be mentioned in passing. The Confederates insisted that it was a breach of faith for officers liberated on parole to be sent to our northwestern frontier against the Indians, a claim to which there could be no foundation, unless the savages who were then massacring the women and children of the frontier were to be regarded as the allies of the Confederacy. This claim the President, while anxious to avoid the slightest imputation of bad faith, refused to allow. Arrests of citizens for treasonable practices by the United States government was another ground of complaint and of threats to repudiate the cartel. So was the levy of military contributions by Pope and his army. All cases of grievances were promptly considered and, if possible, redressed. The President never allowed any consideration of etiquette to stand in the way of the release of prisoners. It was after the proclamation of emancipation that the most serious obstacle to the exchange of prisoners arose. The government at Richmond had refused from the beginning to regard Negro troops as soldiers. Mr. Seddon, then their Secretary of War, in a letter to General Beauregard, dated November 30, 1862, instructed him that slaves in flagrant rebellion were subject to death, that they could not be recognized as soldiers, even so far as to be tried and shot by court-martial. Summary execution must therefore be inflicted upon them, but, to guard against abuses, this power of death should be lodged in the general commanding the immediate locality of the capture. The object of these hellish instructions was evidently to prevent any record of the murder of Negro soldiers being made. On the 24th of December, 1862, Jefferson Davis issued his proclamation declaring General Butler a felon, ordering him to be hanged without trial as soon as captured, and also directing that no commissioned officer of the United States taken captive should be released on parole until Butler was caught and hanged, declaring all commissioned officers in Butler's command robbers and criminals deserving death, and ordering them, whenever captured, to be reserved for execution. This frantic proclamation, of course, put an end for a time to the exchange of officers on either side. In his message of the 12th of January, Mr. Davis proposed to deliver all Union officers thereafter captured to the civil authorities to be punished as criminals inciting to servile insurrection, and on the 1st of May the Confederate Congress passed substantially the law he proposed. It will never be known to what extent the Confederate officers obeyed the horrible instructions of the rebel authorities. Whenever questions were asked by the United States agents of exchange, Mr. Old took a simple and easy way out of the difficulty. He pretended to know nothing about it. He reported his action in this respect to his government in a letter which deserves to be made known, as it preserves in a few lines the moral portrait of this serviceable person. 
as yet the federals he said do not appear to have found any well authenticated case of the retention of the negro prisoners they have made several special inquiries but in each case there was no record of any such party and i so responded having no special desire to find any such case it is more than probable the same answer will be returned to every such inquiry we find however in the rebel archives several documents which indicate the commission of revolting crimes upon captured colored soldiers on the thirteenth of june eighteen sixty three general kirby smith commanding the trans mississippi department wrote a letter to general richard taylor who commanded in louisiana containing these words i have been unofficially informed that some of your troops have captured negroes in arms i hope this may not be so and that your subordinates who may have been in command of capturing parties may have recognized the propriety of giving no quarter to armed negroes and their officers in this way we may be relieved from disagreeable dilemma in an official order written the same day he repeated this draconic injunction and added that if unfortunately any black soldiers should be taken alive they should not be executed by the military as that would provoke retaliation but should be turned over to be dealt with by the civil authorities to which of course he said no exception can be taken hundreds of living men who were acquainted with generals smith and taylor who have sat at table with them who have known them as men of sense and refinement will find it difficult to appreciate the strange mental and moral conditions into which they must have wandered before they could put their hands to propositions so unconsciously fiendish unhappily we are not allowed the comfort of believing that these crimson edicts went unfulfilled we have the evidence that confederate officers of high rank did not scruple to murder negro prisoners and then lie about it to avoid retaliation on the eighth of august general george l andrews commanding at port hudson having heard a rumor of the execution of certain colored soldiers near jackson interrogated the confederate colonel j l logan in regard to it logan denied the story not squarely but evasively saying that if done at all it was without his knowledge or authority threatening vengeance in case of any severity to his soldiers and informing andrews of his intention to place the union prisoners in his hands in close confinement the facts which andrews was at that time unable to ascertain were far worse than he suspected the reports of colonels john griffith and frank powers show that a squad of negroes in arms was captured at jackson on the third of august while bringing them into camp four of the negroes attempted to escape colonel powers reports i ordered the guard to shoot them down in the confusion the other negroes attempted to escape likewise i then ordered every one shot and with my six shooter assisted in the execution of the order i believe few escaped most of them being killed instantly there is no tone of any regret or apology in this both these officers are as complacent over their exploit as young hunters talking about a good bag of game it is hard to enter into the minds of men to whom these things are possible unless we reflect that an environment of slavery created peculiar ideas of humanity and morals mr lincoln was helpless in face of this state of things he was incapable of ordering the bloody reprisals required by the lex talionis he could not have caused such orders to be executed if they had been given the public opinion of the north would not have permitted it while mr old was spurring his government to every extreme of cruelty general e a hitchcock wrote to the secretary of war that his mind was full night and day of the awful subject of retaliation and while he acquiesced in the threats the government had made to protect the lives of its soldiers he earnestly advised that they should not be carried out if they choose in the south he said to act as barbarians we as a civilized people ought not to follow their example the president was compelled to take the same view he could not get accurate information as to the murder or enslavement of negroes the confederates denied every specific case and he could not destroy an innocent man in cold blood for a crime his superiors had committed he remained therefore at a grievous disadvantage in face of the richmond authorities in regard to the question of prisoners from the beginning to the end it was not possible on the other hand even for mr davis to carry out the full rigor of his proclamation whatever his wishes might have been he could not send every captured officer to the gallows he could not publicly withdraw his threats but from time to time the agents of the respective governments were permitted to carry on exchanges not only of enlisted men but of officers 
the union agent tried hard to get a declaration that the proclamation was revoked but this was sometimes angrily refused and sometimes courteously evaded by the confederates there were other causes of dispute the cartel provided that all prisoners of war on either side should be sent either to aiken's landing on the james river or to vicksburg to be paroled or exchanged though the commanders of the two opposing armies might agree on other points no attention was paid to this rule by the rebel authorities unless it suited them they continually paroled prisoners on the field whom they were unable to take with them soldiers captured in cavalry raids citizens seized on their farms or in the streets and insisted upon their equivalents in exchange the federal commissioner would protest an angry interchange of notes would take place and the matter would end by the union commissioner yielding the point for the time being and giving notice that it would not be allowed again the whole performance would be repeated a few months later the union authorities for instance allowed full equivalents for the thirteen thousand men paroled and turned loose at harper's ferry in order that the captors might take part in the battle of antietam and it did the same for the victims of stuart's maryland raid on the other hand the confederates took advantage of the paroles given by pemberton's army at the capitulation of vicksburg arbitrarily declaring the prisoners exchanged and sent them a heavy reinforcement to bragg's army at chattanooga in june 1863 a serious question arose from the treatment to which colonel a d streit and his officers were subjected they had been captured in a cavalry raid in alabama and georgia and on the pretext that they were inciting slaves to insurrection they had been excluded from the privilege of exchange and had been put in close confinement as felons in this case the union authorities imprisoned john h morgan and his men in retaliation both streit and morgan eliminated the personal element from this controversy by escaping from jail the confederates continued to the end the practice of treating men of any political prominence with especial severity messrs j h brown and a d richardson civilians were treated with great cruelty and their exchange persistently refused because they were connected with the new york tribune colonel harry white was served with the same injustice because he was a republican member of the pennsylvania senate and his absence made a tie in that body mr old boasted that he refused a major general for him old prized his civilian prisoners and resisted all attempts at their release in one instance when the richmond authorities had ordered the release of one webster an inoffensive citizen of maryland captured in a cavalry raid old protested saying he wished that he had several hundred like him we must have a northern pressure to assist us that can only be obtained by holding on to every northern union man the controversy between the officers of exchange continued through the year eighteen sixty three though the capture of general w f lee at the end of june put a sudden stop to the threats of hanging union officers as to exchanges mr old apparently had things very much his own way he would put in lists of thousands of paroles of prisoners said to have been captured at indefinite times and places which after due protest and dispute the united states commissioner in his anxiety to effect exchanges would allow in november the reports of the sufferings of union prisoners in the south had grown so rife that the secretary of war after vainly endeavoring to bring about some amendment or at least elicit some definite information at last gave an order that confederate prisoners should be subjected to the same treatment received by union men in southern prisoners this order was not executed as general hitchcock reported that it would result in an uprising against the guards at camps newton and chase and other slenderly guarded places human nature he said would not endure such treatment under an ordinary system of guards the unhappy soldiers in southern hands were so debilitated by insufficient food so deterred by menaces of wholesale massacre to be mentioned more particularly hereafter that there was little danger of their rising against their keepers mr lincoln and mr stanton felt keenly the sufferings of these unfortunate soldiers and every expedient short of absolute surrender to mr old's demands was resorted to in the autumn and winter of eighteen sixty three to effect their liberation old stubbornly insisted upon an immediate exchange of all prisoners the excess on either side to be paroled and this while mr davis's proclamation declaring large classes of federal officers and soldiers outlaws was still in force experience had shown that as soon as old effected an exchange on parole he would declare the paroled soldiers regularly exchanged and they would be sent into the field as there was a large excess of confederates in union hands every exchange was a reinforcement of their armies 
besides this the southerners were so much better cared for in northern prisons that they required far less time for recuperation than the released union prisoners old himself wrote in a moment of cynical candor to his own government the arrangement i have made works largely in our favor we get rid of a set of miserable wretches and receive some of the best material i ever saw while therefore the united states government could not effect the release of all of its suffering soldiers the commissioner did all he could by way of partial exchanges mr old thriftily managed in all cases to get more than he returned boasting of his success in this respect in his official reports late in november the union commissioner sick at heart at the stories brought up by released surgeons of the condition of their comrades proposed the immediate exchange of twelve thousand on each side which old refused general hitchcock a man of the greatest delicacy and humanity suggested that another might succeed where he with his best efforts had failed to relieve this vast sum of misery upon this general halleck offered general lee full equivalents for all the union prisoners in richmond leaving other questions for future settlement and general lee declined the proposition on the twelfth and on the same day the confederates sent back notice by a flag of truce boat that they would receive no more supplies for the relief of union prisoners in December 1863, General Butler was put in charge of the exchange of prisoners at Fort Monroe. Mr. Olp was promptly directed to give notice that, as General Butler was under outlawry by order of the Confederate government, no communication could be held with him. But this puerile attitude was, after a while, tacitly abandoned, and on the 29th of March, Old asked Butler for a conference, and during the next month partial exchanges were resumed. Mr. Old continued reinforcing the Southern armies by releasing exchanged prisoners from their paroles. At one time he declared exchanges when the balance in favor of the Union side was over 34,000, by General Hitchcock's showing, and over 16,000 by his own. Butler wanted the United States government to follow this bad example, but they declined, preferring to stand the injury rather than begin a competition of bad faith. The War Department estimated that this action of the two governments, in relation to prisoners, made a difference against the United States in the campaign of 1864 of 40,000 men. When General Grant came east, after his appointment to the chief command of all the armies, he introduced a somewhat sterner spirit into the negotiations for exchange. He ordered General Butler to give up no more prisoners until equivalents for the Vicksburg and Point Hudson captures were received, and to insist upon a formal agreement of the Confederate government to make no distinction between white and colored prisoners. These requirements were communicated to the Confederate commissioner, and caused a secession of exchanges. In the face of this altered demeanor of the United States authorities, the Confederates became, in turn, the suitors for exchange. Unavowed motives were perhaps at work on both sides. General Grant had come to the conclusion that the system of exchange, as carried on, resulted in serious disadvantage to the fighting force of the Union Army, while the Confederate authorities had doubtless been somewhat affected by the appalling reports made to them by their own officials of the frightful mortality among the Union prisoners, threatening their entire extinction, and, besides, the steady advance of Sherman southward made the danger of their rescue every day more serious. The Confederates now began to press for exchange, and the Union authorities to grow more exacting as to conditions. The first intimation received from Mr. Old that he was ready to exchange prisoners man for man was made on the 10th of August, 1864. General Butler replied in a caustic letter, reviewing the whole question in a combative spirit, and demanding a withdrawal of the Confederate menace of death to the Negro troops and their officers. Commissioner Old took this letter as a rejection of his offer, and stated in the Richmond papers that the United States had refused the Confederate tender of exchange. This was intended for political effect in the North, the Confederate authorities being much preoccupied at this time with the effort to defeat Mr. Lincoln's re-election. Howell Cobb, wrote to Mr. Seddon, suggesting that the prisons be polled, and all soldiers opposed to Lincoln be sent home on parole. He enumerates the following advantages of such a course. 1. We get clear of feeding and guarding that many prisoners. 2. We give that many votes and influence against Lincoln's election. 3. We show the Yankee people that Lincoln is refusing to exchange for political purposes. The Secretary of War referred this ingenious scheme to Mr. Old, who doubted its efficacy. Little was done during the summer and early autumn except to arrange the exchange of some thousands of sick and disabled prisoners, but on the 6th of October Mr. Old, having made a proposal for the mutual forwarding of supplies to prisoners, 
the government of the united states which had frequently made the same suggestion in vain now eagerly embraced it general grant was authorized also to reopen the subject of exchange it is the desire of the president his instructions said that no efforts consistent with national safety and honor be spared to effect the prompt release of all soldiers and loyal persons in captivity to the rebels as prisoners of war or on any other grounds yet in spite of the ardent desire of mr lincoln to have the matter expedited there was so much of technical obstruction and delay that it was the twenty eighth of december before the questions at issue were settled and the fifth of the next february before all arrangements were made and the final exchanges actually begun as to the comparative treatment of prisoners by the respective sides there is no room for doubt the two ponderous volumes of testimony to which allusion has been made contain unquestionable evidence of nameless suffering which we cannot bring ourselves at this day even to summarize in addition to these there is the report of the select committee of the thirty eighth congress describing the shocking condition of released union prisoners at annapolis and the more elaborate and careful report of the commission of inquiry appointed by the united states sanitary commission consisting of eminent physicians jurists and clergymen special students of the subject are referred to these documents they disclose a state of facts not fit for general reading the spirit of the time the circumstances of the case which made these horrors possible are gone forever the readers of the present day could not make the proper allowance for them and the naked story of those who came alive out of libby and bell isle and andersonville would awaken either incredulity or a feeling of resentment which it is undesirable to excite of course there are counter charges from the other side but there is a noticeable difference of tone in the accounts given by union men of southern prisons and those in which confederate soldiers describe their treatment in the north in the one there is a grim gloomy earnestness as of men who have been saturated with horrors which have permanently darkened their lives in the other there is the note of humorous petulance the style in which a young clerk abuses his boarding-house or the tourist lashes out at the railway restaurant among the worst outrages of which they complain were the rough words they sometimes received from guards and the insolent looks of the negro soldiers the southerners were of course not happy at johnson's island or fort delaware it is inconvenient to be restrained of one's liberty and prison fare is not always plentiful or palatable but all the reports agree that there was no systematic overcrowding and the ration was wholesome and sufficient at fort delaware every prisoner could bathe in the river as often as he chose each prisoner had a bunk to himself their health improved steadily from the moment to the end of their imprisonment johnson's island in sandusky bay is a pleasant spot though the confederates complained of the cold in winter it embraced three hundred acres the prison buildings were substantial and not uncomfortable there was a spacious square for the exercise of the prisoners there were never more than twenty five hundred men there at once at andersonville the prison pen measured thirty-five acres in all many acres of which were swamp and in that enclosure were crammed thirty-five thousand men at point lookout one of the largest depots there were about nine thousand confederate prisoners and only four hundred in hospital miss dix reported the following menu for the sick beef tea beef soup rice milk punch milk gruel lemonade stewed fruits beefsteak mutton and vegetables these things are not said with any motive of laudation there was no reason why prisoners should not be treated kindly in northern prisons money and stores were plentiful there would have been no excuse for privation it would have been impossible for the confederates to treat their prisoners equally well the captives at fort delaware fared better than the clerks in the department at richmond there was a difference of motive also the united states government always looked forward to the time when their enemies would be citizens and friends the hope of the confederates was that they should be forever aliens unfortunately it cannot be said that union prisoners at the south were treated as well as was possible we will use in proof of this only the reluctant testimony of southern officials in the summer of eighteen sixty four lieutenant colonel d t chandler was sent to andersonville to inspect the prison there from his report to the confederate authorities we condense the following statement in which his own words are generally used the federal prisoners were confined in a stockade fifteen feet high enclosing an area of five hundred and forty by two hundred and sixty yards a railing around the inside of the stockade and about twenty five feet from it constituted the dead line beyond which prisoners were forbidden to pass on pain of death the center was occupied by a noisome swamp covering three and a half acres 
reducing the available area to 23 and a half acres, which gives somewhat less than six square feet to each prisoner. A small stream passing through the enclosure furnished the only water for washing accessible to the prisoners, and the troops of the guard, encamped above the stockade, rendered this water unfit for use. The soil on the edges of the stream being used as a sink was a loathsome marsh, breeding pestilence. There was no shelter for prisoners, they were exposed to all the rigor of the skies. They died of sunstroke at one time, of cold and exposure at others. The crowding and the famine developed frightful accesses of passion among them. The strong oppressed the weak. Murders were not uncommon, until at last the prisoners themselves organized a lynch court and hanged six of the homicides. There was no medical attendance provided within the stockade. Medical officers appeared at the gates each day, but the crowd of agonized wretches was so great that only the strongest could be served. There were hospitals outside, but they afforded no room for a tithe of the sick. The dead who had died from unknown causes, and whom the medical officers had never seen, were daily carted out of the stockade by the score. They were tumbled into nameless graves, their fingers were chopped off with axes to remove their rings. Colonel Chandler was shocked at the sanitary condition of the place. The prisoners were dying like flies from scurvy and diarrhea. No effort, he said, was made to arrest the mortality by means of proper food. The ration consisted of a little bacon and unbolted cornmeal, many witnesses testifying that the grain and the cobs were ground up together. No soap or clothing was ever issued. The death rate increased with appalling rapidity. In March, it was three and seven tenths percent per a month. In July, six and three tenths percent. Colonel Chandler concluded his report with this terrible arraignment of General Winder. He recommended his removal, and the substitution in his place of someone who unites both energy and good judgment with some feeling of humanity and consideration for the welfare and comfort of the vast number of unfortunates placed under his control, someone who at least would not advocate deliberately and in cold blood the propriety of leaving them in their present condition until their number has been sufficiently reduced by death to make the present arrangement suffice for their accommodation, who will not consider it a matter of self-laudation and boasting that he had never been inside the stockade, a place the horrors of which it is difficult to describe, and which is a disgrace to civilization, the condition of which he might, by the exercise of a little energy and judgment, even with the limited means at his command, have considerably improved. We may safely leave the case with these words of honest indignation from a truthful and high-minded Confederate officer. Winder soon afterwards received a promotion, and was made Commissary General of Union Prisoners. Side by side with this report of a professional soldier, we will place a few extracts from the report of an eminent Southern surgeon, Dr. Joseph Jones, who inspected Andersonville in August 1864, under the orders of the Confederate Surgeon General, not with any humane intentions toward the prisoners, but purely in the interest of pathology. It is written in a manner curiously calm and cold and the good faith of the writer is made evident by his throwing upon the government of the United States the blame for the miseries he so graphically describes. We are forced to omit the most revolting particulars of this singular document, but a few passages will serve to show a condition of things which would sound incredible if related in Zululand. The report sets forth that the large number of men confined within the stockade soon, under a defective system of police, covered the low ground with ordure, which, by occasional rising of the water in time of rain, was distributed over the enclosure, there being not force of current sufficient to carry it away. The refuse of the camp was thrown there. The action of the sun excited rapid fermentation and a horrible stench. The stagnant water quivered with life. Dr. Jones not only found the hospital overcrowded, but the stockade filled with sick who were receiving no care. There were great numbers walking about, suffering with severe and incurable diarrhea, dysentery, and scurvy. Men died by hundreds, and their deaths were entered in the books under the head of Morbi Varii, showing they had not even been seen by a surgeon. Dr. Jones found, to his surprise, few cases of malarial fever. He inferred that the artificial atmosphere of the stockade, crowded densely with human beings and loaded with animal exhalations, was unfavorable to the existence and action of malarial poison. The effects of scurvy were manifested on every hand and in all its various stages, from the muddy pale complexion, pale gums, feeble, languid muscular motions, to the swollen features, livid bleeding gums, loose teeth, 
odomaceous limbs, spasmodically flexed extremities, spontaneous hemorrhages, and large spreading ulcers covered with purplish fungus growth. From the crowded condition, filthy habits, bad diet, and depressed condition of the prisoners, their systems had become so disordered that the smallest abrasion of the skin, from the rubbing of a shoe, or from the effects of the sun, or from the prick of a splinter, or from scratching, or mosquito bite, took on rapid and frightful ulceration and gangrene. He attributes this morbid condition to the improper food furnished, asserts that it might easily be improved by giving the prisoners green corn and other vegetables, which were plentiful. He draws this hideous picture. The haggard, distressed countenances of these miserable, complaining, dejected living skeletons, crying for medical aid and food, and cursing their government for its refusal to exchange prisoners, and the ghastly corpses, with their glazed eyeballs staring up into vacant space, with the flies swarming down their open and grinning mouths, and over their ragged clothes infested with numerous lice, as they lay among the sick and dying. To the want of proper police and hygienic regulations also he attributed the dreadful aggregate of nearly 10,000 deaths from February to September. There can be no accurate count of the mortality in rebel prisons. The report made by the War Department to the 40th Congress shows that about 188,000 Union soldiers were captured by the Confederates, that half of them were paroled and half confined in prison. Of this number, 36,000 died in captivity. The Union armies, on the other hand, captured 476,000 Confederates. Of these, 277,000 were retained as prisoners and 30,000 died. While the percentage of mortality in northern prisons was 13 in the 100, that in rebel prisons was 38. We will not continue the recital of these monotonous miseries which meet us in the history of Libby, of Salisbury, and of Bell Island in the very sight of the Confederate government at Richmond. There are other reports like that of Colonel Chandler, of honorable Confederate officers outraged beyond endurance by the sufferings which seemed to them wantonly inflicted upon helpless prisoners. There is evidence of Southern priests whose hearts were torn by the agonies of Catholic soldiers dying of want and privation in the murderous stockade. But this accumulation of anguish would be an ungrateful task. We will refer to only two more incidents which show how the terror of immediate and violent death was occasionally added to the daily torments to stifle every aspiration for freedom in the hearts of the miserable captives. At the time of Kilpatrick's abortive cavalry raid toward Richmond, it was feared the city might be taken and the prisoners rescued. We will not trust ourselves to tell in our own language the means adopted to prevent such a rescue. A joint committee of the Confederate Congress, saying of it in a report intended to vindicate their actions in the treatment of prisoners, a mine was prepared under the Libby prison, a sufficient quantity of gunpowder was put into it, and pains were taken to inform the prisoners that any attempt at escape made by them would be effectually defeated. In July 1864, when Sherman's rapid march towards Atlanta had thoroughly alarmed the Confederates as to the safety of the prisoners they held, General Winder issued an order to the guards on duty at Andersonville. On receiving notice that the enemy had approached within seven miles of this post to open fire upon the stockade with grape shot, without reference to the situation beyond these lines of defense, it is better, he added, that the last Federal be exterminated than be permitted to burn and pillage the property of loyal citizens, as they will do if allowed to make their escape from prison. Here is no pretense of necessity, nor of self-defense. General Winder simply says it is better to slaughter 30,000 helpless, starving men than to run the risk of a Georgia farmer losing his hayrick. Justice is sometimes wrought in strange ways. This heartless jailer, who boasted to Colonel Chandler that he had never been inside the stockade and that, if it was too crowded, he would kill enough to make it fit, was still near enough his victims to breathe their tainted air. He contracted gangrene of the face and died not long after his promotion. End of chapter 17 and end of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7, by John Hay and John George Nicolay.